Everybody said, I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And for those who are coming for the first time, we're so happy you are here. And in all the other districts and all the states and regions and all the countries in Africa and beyond, you are coming for the first time, you are a special guest, and we pray that the blessing of the Lord will be overloaded in your life today in Jesus' name. And for those who have been coming and now in the new year you have come, 2020 confirmation in your life. The Lord bless everyone. And you need to tell your friends, you need to tell your brothers and sisters, other members of the church who have not been coming, make it a point of duty this year, you'll bring something, somebody along. Can I have a good amen? It will happen in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name because of the faithfulness of your people and the way you have brought us so that we can learn from your word. We're asking, Lord, that every word that comes out from you will accept, will embrace, will believe, and we will do as you teach us in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that your word will bear fruit in every life and will bear fruit in the whole church. I will pray that your grace to keep on abiding and to keep on standing and to keep on obeying your grant to every one of us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Today we are continuing with our Bible study in the Gospel according to St. Mark. We've already done chapters 1 to 9. And now we're starting with chapter 10. Today we're looking at chapter 10 of Mark, verses 1 to 12. Mark, chapter 10, from verse 1, all through to verse 12. And he arose from this, and comes into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, that means as he always did, he taught them again. Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? They said, and they said, Moses suffered us, permitted us, allowed us, to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. And it when the two shall be one flesh, so then they no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he says unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife, and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Tonight we're looking at Christ's teaching on the permanence of marriage. Christ taught the people, he showed the people the mind of God. And he showed the people the word of God that changes not, the word that abides, the word that will turn our lives around, the word that will make us live a life that is pleasing unto God, 
the word that will take us totally away from the world, away from the principles of the world, away from the practices of the world, and make us abide in the word of God and live by faith and live by love and live by the commandments of God so that we can please God. And when we live by faith and we live by love, and we live by the declaration, revelation of the word of God. When we leave this world, we'll be able to get to heaven and live with God in heaven. That's why, as we look at this important subject tonight, we're asking ourselves, what does God say about marriage? What did Christ teach about marriage? What has the Holy Spirit recorded for us concerning marriage? What is the church to stand on concerning marriage? How are you to live? How do you get married? When you are married, how do you stay married? And when there's any problem in that marriage, what's the understanding we have as children of God that our marriage ought to be permanent? That what God has joined together, let no man, let no religion, let no country, let no lawyer, let nobody, let no court put asunder. That's what the Lord is telling us today. That's what the Lord is teaching us today. The unutterable teaching, unalterable teaching, a teaching that we cannot modify. A teaching we cannot change. A teaching we cannot adjust to the modern time and to the people who are living today. The Christ on all tribal teaching on the permanence of marriage. Because there are many ideas today. There are many concepts today. The, the people of the world have their own ideas about marriage. They try this woman and if that one doesn't work, they try another and they try another and try another until there is no permanence in their marriage that's the people of the world and when we come to the lord he rectifies everything in our lives he corrects everything in our lives he cleanses us he forgives our past and then he puts our feet on the straight path that leads to heaven it was actually Christ who was teaching the people about the kingdom of God. He was teaching the people about the knowledge of the truth, because knowledge is truth, and knowledge is light. And the knowledge we have in the word of God, as we accept, as we believe, and as we live by that word, it changes our lives. He shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Tonight, if you are in bondage, it will set you free. Your marriage, it'll set you free. Your personal life, it'll set you free. And he said, if ye continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed. And so it is not just something we learn in theory. This is the word of Christ, our Savior. Christ, our light. Christ, our very life. Christ, our Redeemer. And he wants us to continue in that word. It says, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And this is one area of the teaching of Christ that many churchgoers do not even look at. This is one area of the teaching of the word of Christ that many people who are religious, they just toss aside. They say they believe in Christ, but they go their own way. They say they believe in Christ and they practice whatever they want to practice. They say they believe in Christ and the word of Christ on this important subject is thrown away. And when you come to that, they say, no, 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 I don't accept that one. This is what I'm going to do. If you are going to remain in Christ and if you belong to Christ and if you're going to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord here is the word of the Lord is revealing to us tonight the grace to abide God will give us I said the grace to obey God will give us and the grace not to have our own will our own notion our own petty kind of uh, teaching you know, tossing aside the teaching of Christ the grace to abide by the word of God he will give to you give to me give to all of us in Jesus name and in the language of the mother of Jesus whatever whatsoever he says unto you do it it's going to talk to you. 
is going to talk to me. He's going to talk to everyone. And the Lord has recorded it now and has said, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. You might be hearing it for the first time, like those servants who were, who were told, fill the water pots with water. They had that for the first time, and they did it. You might be hearing the word, the standard, the teaching, the doctrine for the first time. Whatsoever he says to you, the Lord will give you the spirit, the mind, the heart, the grace, and the desire to do it. And you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. Anyone in the house, I said you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. Christ's unalterable teaching on the permanence of marriage. We're dividing the message tonight, that message I've read to you, we're dividing into three parts. Number one, the perversion of marriage by hardened hearts. The perversion of marriage by hardened hearts. Point number two, the permanence of marriage for heaven-bound hearts. Those who are going to heaven, those who are pilgrims of heaven, those who have their mind set on things on high. And they know that this world is not everything about our lives. That there is still a life beyond, and there is a goal beyond, and there is a heaven. Those who are heaven bound, those who are heavenly minded, here is something for them. The permanence of marriage for heaven bound hearts. Point number three. The pestilence on marriage through hateful hearts. The pestilence, the pain, the plague, the pollution of marriage through hateful hearts. There are people that get into marriage and they do not understand. The love with which was started the marriage is the love that will should continue in the marriage. They allow the love to wane. They allow the love to dry up. They allow the love to stop. And then they switch over into hatred. They switch over into hypocrisy. They switch over into hating each other. And in that state of hatred, they pollute the marriage. They divide the marriage. They destroy the marriage. And they have the repercussion of that marriage eventually they separate point number three the pestilence of marriage through hateful hearts we're coming back to point number one point number one the perversion of marriage by hardened hearts we're coming back to matthew chapter 10 i'm reading from verse one Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. Look at this. And as he was wont, this is what he always did. One person he'll teach, two he'll teach, a multitude he'll teach, a crowd he'll teach. That was his habit. That was his mission. That was his commission. And that is what he always did as he was warned. He taught them again. He had taught them before. He taught them again. And we're following after Christ because he has ordained us. He has appointed us. And he has told us to go and teach everything that he taught. How did he teach? How should we teach when it says, and he taught them again look at ecclesiastes chapter 12 teaching them and teaching us ecclesiastes i'm reading from chapter 12 verse 9 it says in verse 9 and moreover because the preacher was wise and nobody no teacher as wise as christ no teacher as wise as a redeemer and he taught them again and taught them again. In fact, it says, they marveled, they were astonished at his wisdom. And the same thing if you are following after Christ. If Christ has appointed you 
and you're teaching like he taught, and you're teaching what he taught, and you're teaching the way he wants you to teach, here is that you are going to teach and moreover because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. He taught the people knowledge. Whenever Jesus taught, the people got truth that they didn't have before. They got the knowledge they didn't have before. They got understanding that they didn't have before. And the same thing today. If Christ lives in the preacher, if the Holy Ghost lives in the preacher, if the word of Christ abides in the heart of the preacher, he will teach the people knowledge. Yea. He gave good heed and he sought out and he set in order many principles, many proverbs, many precepts set in order. We don't just, uh, you know, read, uh, you know, this verse and that verse without setting them in order. That's the way Jesus taught and that's the way he has told us to teach. We will teach. And as we teach, our people will learn. You will learn. Say, I will learn. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. He taught them again. What did he teach them? We've seen how he taught them. He set things in order. He taught them knowledge. He brought them into divine truth. But what was the material of his uh, teaching? We're looking at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, reading from verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. No other one is the Savior. Then shall ye know I am He, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Then shall ye know that I am He, the one that forgives sin, the one that saves, the one that converts, and the one that changes our lives and gives us grace to live according to the word of God so we can get to heaven. Then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. As my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Look at verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father told me what to teach. Not only that, he's staying by my side. He's watching over me. He's hearing everything I'm teaching. To make sure that what Christ was teaching, everything was in line or the Father had taught him. The Father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. And that's the reason why, as you come tonight, you are saying, Oh Lord, as you taught in days gone by, teach me again. And as you teach me, whatever is amiss and whatever is not right, that I need to correct, your grace to correct, you will grant unto me. You will grant unto every one of us. Look at Job, you want to underline this in your Bible? Job, I'm reading from chapter 34. Job. Chapter 34, and we're reading from verse 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will offend, I will not offend anymore. You see, sometimes when we come to the church and we preach the word of God, there are people who do not know how to pray. But you see, after you've had the word of God, you go through that word of God tonight. We're studying about marriage. You look at every detail. You look at everything that the Lord is teaching us. And then you are saying, according to that verse 31, surely it is me to be said unto God. That's in prayer. I have borne chastisement. We've had some problems in some marriages, in some families. And you need to be able to know the genesis and the origin and the source of those problems. And many families have suffered, husbands have suffered, wives have suffered, children have suffered. And we say, a bunch of chastisement, I will offend no more. I will not offend anymore. That which I see not, teach thou me. Maybe I'm the one causing problem in my family. That which I see not, teach thou me. Maybe I'm the one that is making the spouse, the partner, to think about divorce and to think about separation. That which I see not, teach thou me. 
maybe I'm the cause of the children not wanting to stay at home and not wanting to be united with the family. That which I see not teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. I will do no more. I will do no more. Our lives, our marriages, our families are supposed to be transformed when we hear the word of God. It will be so in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 2. And the Pharisees came unto him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? They asked a question. Actually, the Lord was in the middle of his teaching. He was teaching the multitude. He was teaching the people. He had not stopped. He didn't say, if you have any question on what I've taught, you can raise up your hand. I'll give you a chance. He didn't say that. But he just came in and he just intruded into what was seen. He said, please, please, we have an urgent question. Is it all right? Is it lawful? Is it normal? Is it acceptable for a man to put away his wife? And it says they were tempting him. They thought he would not be able to give them an answer. But you understand, Christ is the word personified. And whatever question they asked, he was ready to answer them. Verse 3, and he answered and said, what did Moses command you? You are doctors of the law, you are teachers of the law, you are priests of the law, and you are Levites, and you are people that know the law of God. What did Moses command you? Look at this, verse 4. And he said, Moses suffered us, permitted us to write a bill of divorcement and put her away. The woman could not put the man away, but they arrogated to themselves the authority and the power to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote for you this precept. For the hardness of your heart. Their marriage was perverted because their hearts were hardened. Their lives were perverted because their hearts were hardened. They still kept the hard heart. And they still kept the strong will that they were not going to do the will of God. And so because of that, their hearts were hardened. Did Moses know that their hearts were hardened? And did he know that was giving them that permission? Because after all, they were hiding as Adam and stone. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're reading from verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 31. And I'm reading here from verse 27. For I know that rebellion. Here is Moses talking to them, the children of Israel. He's saying, I know, I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, why I am yet alive with you this day. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? Moses told them, he said, he said I've given you the word. And while I was yet with you, your stiff neck, your rebellious, your hardened, and he said in verse 28, Get unto me all the elders of the tribe of, of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death, ye will utterly corrupt yourselves. You see, Moses knew their hearts were hardened. The, the experience they had before of restoration, of redemption, of salvation, all that they had lost. And the Lord said, come near, I want to circumcise your heart. They never accepted the circumcision of their hearts. 
because it is that experience of circumcision of heart the Lord will have taken away the stony heart but did not allow that and their hearts were hardened against the word of God it says in verse 29 for I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I commanded you and evil will befall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord and provoke him to anger through the work of your own hands. It was telling them their hearts were hardened. Was there any change in all the centuries? Or did, they, did, did their heart become salt and then receptive of the word of God? All those centuries of the Old Testament and all the centuries of the New Testament come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles, reading from chapter 7, and we're looking at verse 51. Acts, chapter 7, verse 51. You sip neck is talking to the Jews. You sip neck is talking to those religious people. They were zealous for the Lord. They were zealous for the old covenant. But it says, you sip neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. The hardness of heart was still there. That's the reason they were not saved. That's the reason they were not converted. That's the reason the hardness remained or removed. It says in verse 52, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept them. You have received the law, you have received the word, but you have not kept them. What's the consequence of that, Romans? chapter 2 Romans chapter 2 they see continued in the hardness of heart Christ preached to them they were still hardened the apostles preached to them they were still hardened Paul the apostle also came to them they were still hardened all the preachers preached to them they were still hardened and in that state of the hardness of heart there's no way they could obey the word of God and they were still saying can we put away our wives for every cause and then, after all, Moses allowed us, will you also permit us? That's what Christ came to reverse. He came to take away the hardness of heart. And once the hardness of heart is taken away, we will no more have permissive will. You will have the perfect will of God in Jesus' name. I say we'll have the perfect will of God in Jesus' name. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 5. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 but after thy hardness and impenitent heart hardness and unrepentant heart people like to go to church they like to carry the bible they like to worship they like to pray they like to fast they like to follow their denominational doctrine but the hardness of heart is not dealt with and because the hardness of heart is not dealt with, you find a separation and divorce rampant among church goers. And uh, there are some people who even claim to be born again, uh, and they do not understand how to straighten out their marriage. I pray God will help us to have softened heart in Jesus' name. It says, after the hardness and impenitent heart, treacherous up unto, thy, unto thyself, roars against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The permission does not cancel the, the, the permission did not cancel the judgment of God. If the hardness of heart is there in every area of their lives, they will not be obeying the Lord, not only on marriage, on all the other areas, once the heart is hardened. 
a treasure unto themselves the wrath of God. Look at verse 6. So I render unto every man according to his deeds. It says in verse 8, But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. For the people that will say after all, I read somewhere in the Old Testament where this person put away his wife. I read another part in the Old Testament where that one put away his wife. And therefore, if they did it, why can't I do it? They did it because of the hardness of their heart. And you do it because of the hardness of your heart. And the Lord says that the perversion of marriage, the perversion of the ministry, and the perversion of life, and the perversion of worship comes out of hardness of heart. Look at verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man. May be a minister that says uh, he has found a way, a place in the Bible. Those uh, people, they divorce their wives. He too, he wants to divorce. If you do it, it says tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man, of the minister, of the member of the church, of anyone, anyone that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Actually, those people had in their hearts and they couldn't get saved. You see, when we get saved, the Lord deals with our heart. But if you are not saved, the hardness of heart will still be there. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 40. John chapter 12. Reading from verse 40. Look at this. It says in verse 40, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart. A hardened heart cannot understand the doctrines of Christ. A hardened heart cannot be low enough, humble enough, to obey the word of God, to even intelligently understand the word of God, and have the grace to do that word of God. It says their hearts are hardened that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted. As long as the hardness of heart is there, there's no conversion. As long as the rigidity is there, there's no conversion. As long as the stiff neck is there, there's no conversion. As long as rebellion against the word of God is there, I know the word of God says it, I know they read that, they read that, but I, I cannot live with the man, I cannot live with the woman, I'm going my way, let him go his way, or let her go away. There's no conversion. It is conversion that turns the heart, that changes the heart, that transforms the heart. It says, lest they should be converted and I should heal them. I pray that God will deal with every heart in heart in Jesus' name. Uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Because of the hardness of their hearts. It's not enough to come to church. It's not enough to read the Bible. It's not enough to hear the preaching of the Bible. What's your response to the preaching of the Bible? The what you were doing before, do you still continue doing? And the way you were before with your wife, with your husband, do you still continue the same way? And year comes after year, we come to a new year. Do you still have the whole habit and the old hardness and the old cruelty and the old um, hatred in your heart? You see, there are many people, they come to the new year and they continue the same old way, the same hardness of heart. I pray that God will melt every heart and God will change every heart. And once the hardness is taken away, you will do what is right towards your wife and towards your husband. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, there's not man saying that, as the Holy Ghost says, he says today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. If ye will hear his voice as to what you need to do in your marriage, as to what you need to correct in your marriage, as to well, you need to take away that hatred, 
as to how you need to take away that separation and divorce. As you hear the word of God today, it says, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the, day, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years. All through those forty years, those Israelites had inched their hearts. Uh, can you imagine somebody saying, uh, I've been in the church now for forty years. All right, my brother. All right, my sister. What's the result? You've been here 40 years. You've had many preachers 40 years. You've had his word 40 years. How does that affect your marriage? How does that affect your attitude? How does that soften your heart? You've attended every conference, every retreat, and every congress 40 years. All right. Praise the Lord. You've attended for 40 years. How has that affected your attitude? How has that broken you down? How has that made you to do restitution? But it is, they were just there. The edge manner. They could say that they had miracle food and miracle water to drink all those 40 years. And yet, in spite of the miracle water they drank, in spite of the miracle food they ate, their hearts were still hardened. Charity begins at home. Righteousness begins at home. Love begins at home. In their homes, there was no charity. In their homes and families, there was no obedience to the word of God. Their hearts were hardened all through the 40 years. Had it not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and probed me and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. You understand? When he asked about marriage, do whatever you want. It was great for them. How can we, uh, do you still want us, one man, one wife, until let's do our part? Do whatever you want. Because it was great for them. He won't talk to them anymore. He won't uphold the standard of them anymore. He was grieved for that generation and said, They do always err. Even if I tell you, are you going to do it? Even if I reveal my perfect will to you, are you going to obey? Do whatever you want to do, and then you'll bear the consequence. They always err in their heart, and they have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath, in my anger, in my indignation, they shall not enter my rest, into my rest. All those 40 years that, you know, they said were permitted now. Have you heard? We're not permitted. We can drive her away. Have you heard? We can separate from her. Have you heard? We can divorce her. And God told them that in their anger, in his anger. You want to do it? Go ahead. You want to separate? All right. Go ahead. You want to divorce her all right go ahead he told them he gave them that in his anger and then he said after they had done that they will not enter into his rest look at verse 15 while it is said today if he will hear his voice had he not your hearts it's repeat again as in the days as in the provocation for some when they had heard did provoke they had the word of God, but they kept on provoking the Lord. They had the word of God. They kept on sticking to the words, works of the flesh. They had the word of God, and they still will annoy God, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? He kept on giving them manna. That's not an evidence that God was happy with them. But that was his mercy. He was wrought with them. He was angry with them. And he wanted to put his judgment on them. And yet he kept on giving them the manna. All the 40 years. You know there are people that will say, You know what? Even though I sent away my wife, When I prayed to be healed, God healed me. That healing does not take you to heaven. That healing is telling you that God is love. And that if you make right your ways, if you show gratitude to God, 
then heaven will be available for you. But these people kept on eating God's manna, drinking God's miracle water, and having the Shekinah glory of God, and having the cloud, and having the fire, the pillar of fire following after them, and it was winning their battles for them, and yet they kept on provoking him. Are you like that? That you are hearing the word of God, you are being prayed for, you're having miracles, you're having this and having that, and yet you remain in your sin. What shall it be when the trumpet shall sound? When the Lord will bring everyone to account, what will it be for you at that time? I pray the grace of God will come upon everyone today. You will make right your way. You will stop the cruelty against your wife and the cruelty against your husband, and you'll be united together in love in Jesus' name. You'll not be, you know, taking scriptures and twisting scripture. I can put away my wife. I can put away my husband. Look at verse 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that he should not, that they should not enter into his race, but to them that believe not. So, verse 19, we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief will not enter heaven. Disobedience will not enter heaven. Putting things upside down will not enter heaven. Having permissive will will not enter heaven. Let's come to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 2, verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them, we do such things, and doest the same thing. You're a teacher, you're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're a reader of the Bible, you're a churchgoer, and you say, this is bad, this is wrong, and you do the same thing. When you hear so-and-so kicked out his wife, you say, what? All these religious people, and you as cruel as that man in your own family. It says, do you think of this, O man, that judges them that do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Look at verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long-suffering? Look at this. Not knowing that the goodness of God God leadeth thee to repentance. All the goodness it shows you, all the good things it reveals to you, all the blessings it showers upon you. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And I pray that this year, anything that is wrong in any of our lives, there will be total repentance in Jesus' name. Is that all the amen you have? The Lord will do it in our lives in Jesus' name. There are people, after they've heard the teaching of the Word of God, then they'll go privately somewhere. They want to go and ask a prophet. They want to go and ask a pastor. They want to go, want to go and ask a seminary professor. Can I put away my wife? Can I put away my husband? After they've heard the word of God, they still have the hardness of heart. Look at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. And they put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Look at verse 4. Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, 
I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. What's the Lord saying? He said, after you've had the word of God and you know it plain and clear in the word of God, that it was because of the hardness of heart that Moses permitted those people, not God, Moses permitted those people to put away their wives. And the Lord is saying, He doesn't want the hardness of heart again. He has the grace to take away this, the stony heart and the hardness of heart. And then, after hearing the clear word of God, you still go behind to a prophet, to a preacher, to a bishop, and to a professor, seminary professor, and you have your idol in your heart. You have your idea what you are going to do in your heart. Look at verse 5. It says that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged through their idols. Verse 6, therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, every one in our church, of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, of our newcomers, which separated himself from me and set up his idols in his heart and put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and come to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me i the lord will answer him by myself and i will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb and i will cut him off from the midst of my people and he shall know that i am the lord when well, you have your idol in your heart you have already decided what you want to do and then you're looking for a preacher you're looking for a prophet you're looking for a pastor that will say exactly what you want and then the Lord says, I'm going to answer that person myself because of the idol, because of the error, because of the stiff neck, and because of the hardened heart. Verse 9, and if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived the prophet. If that prophet also is a compromising prophet, and he, also, he wants the praise of the people, the appreciation of the people, I will, I, I will deceive him and allow him to be deceived and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel and they shall hear the punishment of their iniquity they shall bear the, pun the punishment of their iniquity and the punishment of the prophet counselor and the pro uh, punishment of the prophet of the preacher and the punishment of the compromiser shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him uh, pastor so and so told me i can go ahead preacher so and so told me i can go ahead you're deceived and the deceiver will be punished and you the deceived you'll be punished that the house of israel may go no more astray from me neither be polluted anymore with their transgressions but that they may be my people and that i may be their god says the lord god i pray you'll not be deceived are you still there I said, I pray you will not be deceived. Yeah. How are we not going to be deceived? Come to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. He'll take away the transgression. He'll take away the filthiness. He'll take away that private longing after error, after deception. It says, and you shall be clean, and from all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. He'll take the idol of a man, the idol of the woman, the idol of wrong marriage. He'll take that away from your heart. Once you come to him, and he will cleanse you. Look at verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart, the hard heart, 
the hardened heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Somebody say amen. amen. When he takes the stony heart away, then all those things that they did because of the stony heart, all those things will not be there anymore. And if you're still going back to an excuse, eh, other people did it, I'm going to do it also. I cannot live with the man and I cannot live with the woman. We're going to separate the court is there. If he takes my leaving the church, I will leave the church. Well, if you leave the church, the Bible is still there. If you leave the church, God is still there. If you leave the church, the day of judgment is still there. And God will judge according to the truth he has told us. But you can remove the stony heart. And once the stony heart is taken away, you'll never be the same again. I said you'll never be the same again. He will take every stony heart away. He will take every stony heart away. He will take every stony heart away. And our marriages will be according to the word of God, according to the revelation of God in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the permanence of marriage for heaven-bound hearts. The permanence of marriage for heaven-bound hearts. Please understand, we're teaching because of heaven. We're pointing out what we'll point out because of heaven. We know that if we don't touch this area and we keep quiet about it, many more people might come and they like the church, they like the building, they like every other thing, but they will not be heaven bound. They will not have the grace of God. They will not be holy. They will not be righteous. And we pastors who deceive them to stay in the church and we nurse them, and we pet them, and we deceive them, we, we ourselves will not be even bound. If you're deceiving people, and you cannot tell them the truth, and you're smiling, with, and you know this is the word of God, that marriage is permanent, but you'll not say it because you want all the rich people to stay in the church, all the highly pleased people to stay in the church. They stay in the church, but how about getting to heaven? But as we come week after week, we hear the word of God, the Lord will prepare us for heaven in Jesus' name. I will not preach and go to hell. I will not come to deeper life and go to hell. I will not read Bible and go to hell. I will not walk and walk and walk for God. And yet, hypocritical. Having, um, you know, false doctrine and then go to hell. I pray God will preserve us for heaven in Jesus' name. What's the new year? Amen now. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Your amen is good. I'm just uh, wanting to hear your voice. We're looking at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 6. Mark chapter 10 verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. The Lord Jesus Christ went back to the beginning. He said, if you want to know the truth about, um, about marriage, go back to the beginning. Not to your denomination, not to your own local church, not to your own religious circle. Go back to the beginning. You know? It says from the beginning of creation, God made them male one female one and for this God shall a man one man leave his father one father and mother one mother and cleave to his wife one wife you will see that the father is only one and the mother is only one and the man is only one the wife is only one and then it says in verse in verse 8 and the and they twain not one man and two wives, not one man and three wives, not, not day four, not day five, but day twain, day two shall be one flesh. So then, they are no more twain, but one flesh. But one flesh. Wherefore, what God has joined together, what God has joined together, He joined together by His word. 
a joint together by his precept. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Jesus referred back to the beginning. And whenever you have any challenge and you are asking, hey, what shall I do? You go back to the origin, to the word of God. We're looking at Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. It says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, look at this, male only one and female only one, created he them. Male and female created he them. Look at Genesis chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain and they shall be one flesh actually you remember that after adam and eve had been joined together because god said he's going to make a help meet for him you remember the problem in the family what was the problem eve listening to the serpent and edge of the forbidden fruit and gave to the husband Adam, and he also ate of the forbidden fruit. They backslid, they protestized, and they went away from the Lord. They were hiding from the Lord. And God said, Adam, Adam, where are you? And he said, I had your voice in the garden, and I hid myself. What have you done? Have you eaten of the fruit that I told you not to eat? It's the wife, the woman you gave me that gave me the fruit, and I ate. And woman, what have you done? A serpent that gave me, and I ate. They were judged. But God did not create another woman for Adam. The, the scene was terrible. The sin was great. And that sin affected the whole of the generation of humanity because it passed, they passed the sinful nature onto all their descendants. Even until now, as grave, as terrible as that sin of Eve was, and misleading Adam and giving the fruit to Adam, God did not create another woman for Adam. The will of God in marriage is that the Adam and the Eve should be together. Whatever happens, they are together until death do them part. And the same thing today, whatever happens, husband and wife, one man, one wife, your very first wife, until death do you part. We're looking at Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, so you cannot say, see what my wife has done. Has she done something as great as what Eve did to Anna? As she caused her, you know, being driven away from the Garden of Eden, like what um, Eve did. If there was no divorce between them, and God did not create another woman, think about that. God does not create another one for you today and say, well, I've taken away that one. God has forgiven me. I've driven her away. You make restitution. You call her back so that you are joined together again. We have been studying the book of Job and you have taught the story of Job. How Job lost everything and then boils came all over him. And the wife said, are you still holding on to your integrity? Cause God and die. And uh, said, you speak as one of the foolish women. Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job sinned not with his mouth. The point is this, that Job did not divorce that wife. He was sick. He felt lonely. He felt dejected. He felt miserable. He even complained. But he did not divorce that wife. And as you come to the last chapter of Job, it is from that same wife that he had the children and the boys, the men and the women. Your marriage will stay. Your marriage will abide. Whatever the problem, the Lord knows how to solve the problem. But take away an idol from your heart, looking for another woman, looking for another man. Stay in that marriage because that's the will of God. And that's the mind of God. You will abide in Jesus' name. Look at Genesis chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2. Genesis chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2. Male and female created he them. It's a repetition again. And blessed them and called their name 
other. Look at that. Called their name. Plural. Their name. Adam. That's like saying Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Husband and wife. They have that singular name together. In the day when they were created. Let's look at chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're reading from verse 9. What God has joined together, you and your wife, nothing will separate you. You and your husband, nothing will separate you. If a court has attempted to separate you, uh, tear that uh, paper away and uh, reconcile, and the Lord will bless your marriage in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. Live joyfully for the wife whom thou uh, whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. All the days, all the days. Not just some days. We're tired now. We cannot carry on now. No, you will carry on. You will not be tired of your marriage. You will not be tired of your family. It says, live joyfully. Make yourself happy. Make yourself joyful. Make yourself cheerful. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, all the days which he has given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, repeats that again, for that is thy portion in this life. Your wife he has given you, your husband he has given you, that is your portion in this life. And in thy labor which thou takest under the sun, will abide for the word of God. We're coming to Malachi, Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, here I am reading from verse 14. Malachi chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. See what the Lord is saying. All, all through to the end of the Old Testament. In uh, Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. Look at this. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. When you got married, when you went to the altar, or when you started living together, and your parents accepted, and your parents gave consent, and you're living together as husband and wife, it says the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of thy youth. Not wives, just one, just one, just one. Wife of the youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion. You have dealt treacherously, you have kicked her out, you have spoken lies against her, you have taken her to the court, and the court has separated you, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. That's the way the Lord is still looking at that woman. That's the way the Lord is still looking at you. And he, did he not make one? Yet I did the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take to your, to your spirit and let none of you deal treacherously against the wife of his youth, the first wife, the one that you really married and then you said to all the parents and then you came together, that's the wife of your youth. It says in verse 16, for the Lord, the God of Israel says that he hated putting away. What does God say? He hated putting away. I said, what does God say? What does God say? He hated put, uh, putting away for one covered violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Wherefore, take heed to your spirit that she deal not treacherously. As the Lord has warned us, we remain and abide for the warning of God in Jesus' name. Will not deal treacherously with members of her family. Amen. 
Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, we're reading from verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? You carry the Bible around. Have you not read? You hold the Bible in your hand. Have you not read? Some of us have three Bibles, five Bibles at home, in the same family. Have you not read? Are you just holding the Bible? Are you just carrying the Bible? Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? Have you not read that the will of God is this, and the plan of God is this, and the creation of God affirms it, that he made them male and female, and said, for this cause, shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, only one, only one, and shall cleave unto his wife, and date wane one man, one wife, making two, date wane shall be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain, but one flesh. Watch therefore, God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man put asunder. Let no counselor put asunder. Let no lawyer put asunder. Let no constitution of any country put asunder. The Lord has brought us together. The Lord will keep you together. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10. And unto the marriage I command, yet not I, but the Lord. I'm just a mouthpiece. Paul the Apostle is saying, I'm just repeating the word of the Lord. It says, unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Let the wife abide for the husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. If she depart against the word of God, then she remains unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Once if you have left and you cannot stay alone and you, you need a man, you're not going to another man. It says reconcile to your husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Thank God, the Palai Bible Church, every one of us will be obedient to the word of God in Jesus' name. We will be obedient in Jesus' name. We will not allow economy to separate us. We will not allow the talk talk of various families to separate us. We will not allow childbearing or not childbearing barrenness to separate us. You will remain together. And the Lord will answer your prayer. And until he answers your prayer, you are faithful to the word of God and you abide together. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 28. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Love your wives as your own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. No man ever yet hated his own flesh. You know, sometimes we have problems with members of our body. You're going on the way, and then you knock your right foot against a stone, and then it's bleeding. You don't go to the doctor, cut it off, because it's causing me pain. You treat it. You don't cut it off. No man ever yet ate it. It's own flesh. There are times you are trying to, you know, knock something, a nail into the wood, and then you knock it into your finger, and it pains. You don't cut off the finger just because it's causing you pain. No man ever yet ate it. It's own flesh. There are times that you know maybe you are eating or talking, and your teeth uh, beat uh, your tongue, and you don't go to the um, uh, to the doctor and say, "Pull my tooth out," because is uh, you know biting my tongue you take you take care of every part of your body that's how you show the love and he's saying the same thing you know, the wife might have caused some problems and you might have caused some problems too but no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourishes and 
and cherishes each even as the Lord the church for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones for this cause look at the conclusion look at the conclusion you don't hit yourself all the members of the body are there the same hand you have you are now 50 years old the same hand you've been carrying about for all these 50 years that same hand you have and the same eyeballs you have those same eyeballs you have and the same parts of the body you keep all those members of the body not that they have not hurt you not that they have not made mistakes not that those hands of members of the body have not even caused you know some real terrible sickness that will spend millions of naira but all the same you keep those members of the body in the same way it says for this caution a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh and they too shall be one flesh no divorce in our midst in jesus name no separation in our midst in jesus name you know your neighbors will know that you agree when you say really good good amen, amen. we're coming now to point number three and we're reading from verse uh, chapter 10 mark chapter 10 and i'm reading here from verse 10 mark chapter 10 we're reading from verse 10 and in the house that his disciples asked him again of the same matter his disciples when they came to the house they said this is serious so that you mean that all those uh, things that the pharisees were doing uh, and the pharisees have counseled us if you are not happy with her kick her out and get another one if you are not happy with him uh, you know separate from him uh, and get another one you mean that all those things the pharisees were telling us is wrong we need to ask about this again and in the house his disciples asked him again the same matter hold on now there are people that uh, preach a message on the pulpit and then in the private somebody comes to ask them and said uh, pastor i have a question on that thing that you just uh, touch now and uh, because they see the face of that person and uh, those people they say look at my child look at my challenge and look at my difficulty do you mean that all those things you taught i'm going to stand by that then they say well actually now it's a personal thing you know uh, that one will teach everybody but to tell you the real thing uh, in your own case i think you can do whatever you go and pray and whatever you want to do i'll be praying along with you they do not have the courage they do not have the consistency to affirm the same thing that they have taught or it is uh, you know somebody who is uh, you know just about uh, settling in the church and uh, but he has not made up his mind and he has had that and he says i need to see the pastor urgently because i need to decide whether i'm going to stay in this church or not or i'm going to go to another place and then he comes he says uh, you know Oh, Pastor, I thought that, you know, with all my wealth and all my resources, I could be a blessing to this church. But I had something uh, last uh, time you preached, and this is what you said. And I'm wondering now whether I can stay. I cannot stay. And I've gone to some of my friends in the church, and they say, it's not like that. It's not like that. You can stay, or you can go and ask the pastor. And then the pastor will say, well, actually... Uh, well, you know, uh, we're human beings and uh, fingers are not equal. Some fingers are like this, some fingers are like that. And they bring in, uh, you know, their native parables and they overturn the word of God. I pray it will not happen in this church. The Lord Jesus Christ had taught them, and now the disciples came and they said, they asked him the same thing in verse 11, and he said unto them, Whosoever. He emphasized, whosoever, whosoever it may be, a rich man, a wealthy man, educated man, a professor, a scientist, um, you know, highly pleased people, person in the world, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, committed, uh, and marry another, committed adultery against her. If you 
leave your wife and you go to marry another one, God still counts the first wife as your wife. And the life life you are living now with this second one is adultery. According to the words of Jesus, if you die an adulterer, do adulterers go to heaven? Do adulterers go to heaven? No. We need to get the word of God straight. And if, you, if we are going to get to heaven, we abide by the word of God. But you know, this uh, second wife is uh, treating me well. This second wife is like my junior sister. This second wife is, you know, like my real heart. We're talking about heaven. If your first wife is still alive and you kick her out and you separate from her and you divorce her, and you marry another, Jesus said, you commit adultery against her. Look at verse 12. And if a woman, if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. You will not commit adultery. I said you will not commit adultery. And if you are not going to commit adultery, you stay with your first wife. You stay with the wife of your youth. You're not going to kick her out and then get another one, a younger one, a fresh one. That's not the will of God. It tells us in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. I'm reading from verse uh, Luke chapter uh, 16 verse 18 in Luke chapter 16 uh, reading from verse 18 here are the words of Jesus again whosoever 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 you see there are some uh, preachers they think that you know because they are preachers they are immune to the word of God and the word of God doesn't affect them they can do whatever they can go wherever and they can marry whoever after all they are bishop after all they are professors of religion whosoever but as a way his wife and marries another committed adultery it's a lot jesus had to judge us on the final day the authors of those books you are reading will not be the judge on the final day and the professors of the seminary they will not be your judge on the final day your denomination your denominational leader the founder of your denomination will not be your judge on the final day the father has committed all judgment into the hands of the son and here is the here is the word of the son of god here is the judgment of the son of god and it's the same yesterday today and forever he changes not his teaching changes not whosoever putteth away his wife and marries another committeth adultery and whosoever whosoever Ever marries her that is put away, whosoever marries her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. That's the word of God, and I pray that the grace to abide the Lord will give to everyone. Amen and amen. amen. Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, we're reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 7, we're reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 7, we're coming here now to verse 2. It tells us in Romans chapter 7 verse 2, For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he lives. The woman that uh, who is uh, who has an husband is bound by the law of God by the word of God to her husband so long as that husband is alive but if the husband be dead she is loose from the law of her husband so then if while her husband lives so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress paul the apostle was in agreement with christ he didn't have a separate message a strange doctrine he didn't have a new modern uh, doctrine the same word that christ had emphasized he also emphasized he says she shall be called an adulteress but if her husband be dead she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man after the death of the husband the word of god is clear i will stay by the word of god in jesus name 
We're coming now to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13. Reading from verse 4. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. You have not married. You are still to marry. God plans marriage for everyone. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. All mongers and adulterers, God will judge. I pray God will give us the grace to abide and obey the word of God in Jesus' name. God will give you the grace. He'll give you the strength. He'll give, he'll give you the light to abide by the word of God in Jesus' name. How do we make the marriage to actually stay? It's not the doctrine is there, but the life ought to be there too. That you love each other, you care for each other, and you make each other to feel happy and cheerful and contented in the marriage. I pray God will help you to honor your husband, and God will help you to take care of your wife. There will be no separation, there will be no divorce. We're looking at First Peter chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 16. First Peter chapter 4, we're reading from verse 16. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. If any man suffer as a Christian, you're a Christian, and your wife is not a Christian, is not born again yet, and because of that there's persecution, it's suffering persecution. But you suffer as a Christian or you are uh, the wife that is born again, and your husband is not born again, and she, he causes you to suffer persecution, you bear that persecution as a Christian, will abide in Jesus' name. But let him glorify God on this behalf, for the time has come that judgment must begin where? Will the judgment begin on the street? Where will the judgment begin? At the house of God. Where is the house of God? Here. God says when he's going to judge, he'll start with the people that have been coming. They have heard the word of God and they know the truth. And he's going to test, he's going to find out whether they abide with that word of God or they don't abide with that word of God. After he has judged the people in the house of God, then he will go out and judge the others. Verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, at us, at us believers, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel if the righteous can be saved? Where shall the ungodly sinner, shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You will not remain a sinner. I will not remain a sinner. The grace of God will be abundant in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're looking at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 14. In verse 14, it says, Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with your wife. Follow peace with your husband. Endure whatever may be happening there now. Everything will not remain as it is today. If you will endure, God will bring peace in your family in Jesus' name. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Don't let marriage take away holiness from you. Don't let anything on earth take holiness away from you. Don't let the behavior of a wife or the character of a husband take holiness away from you. Because it says, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Marriage will not take heaven away from you. The family will not take heaven away from you. For the peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God the grace of God will not fail in your life lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you lest any root of bitterness springing up 
trouble your heart, trouble your home, trouble your family. She's not something you don't want to forgive. Forgive. The Lord has forgiven you. You also forgive. And you forgive 70 times, seven times. And keep your marriage and keep your wife and keep your husband. She has said something you know, about you, against you, against your parents, and you're still holding on to that. It will bring the root of bitterness. It will spring up. It will trouble you. Get rid of that bitterness. Forgive and forget your marriage will stay. It says in verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When husband and wife, when they separate, it affects the children, it affects the grandchildren, it affects the in-laws, it affects many, many people, it affects their friends too, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You'll not sell your salvation. You'll not sell your birthright. You'll not say because of this and because of this, I cannot abide by the word of God. I'm going back into the world. If you go back to the world, you are going back to hell. You'll not go back to the world. For ye know how afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. This is our own time. We we'll seek the grace of God, and the grace of God will abide in every life in Jesus' name. Verse 28, verse 28, wherefore we receive in a kingdom that cannot be moved, we're receiving the kingdom of God. We're receiving the eternal kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, the kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. As we obey the word of God, we we'll keep on serving the Lord and great will be the grace of God in our lives in Jesus' name. In particular tonight, even if there's no problem in your marriage, thank God for that, pray about your marriage. Even if there's no problem in your children's marriage, pray about your children's marriage. Even if there's no problem between you and your husband, between you and your wife, pray that the grace of God increase, the grace of God will abide, and marriage will remain the perfect will of God in your life in Jesus' name. No separation, no divorce. There will be love, there will be joy, there will be fruitfulness. There will be the blessings of God overflowing in your families in Jesus' name. And the two of you will abide together, stay together, keep loving together until death do us part. Or if Jesus tarries, uh, or if he wants to come and then take both of you away in the rapture, be it so in your family in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I've had quite a lot today on marriage, on family, on myself and my wife, myself and my husband. I want to abide. I want to stay. I want to stay in the center of the will of God. No divorce, no remarriage until death do your part. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord.